Miss Jaster's Garden by N. M. Bodecker. In a corner of a garden overlooking the sea at Sandgate lived a small spiky animal called a hedgehog, Hedgy for short. In the middle of the garden lived Miss Jaster in Villa Pax, a square whitewashed house with flower pots on the front steps. The two did not see much of each other, but occasionally they met just after sunset when they both enjo enjoyed strolling in the garden. On these occasions, Miss Jaster would go back into the house for a saucer of milk, which she placed at what she hoped was the right end of the hedgehog. But hedgehogs being the shape they are, and Miss Jaster being a little nearsighted, as often as not, she put the saucer where the hedgehog's head wasn't. And Hedgy, so as not to cause distress, politely dipped his tail in the milk and pretended to drink. Later, when Miss Jaster went into the house and lit the lamp on the piano, he drank the milk properly. Through the open door, he could hear Miss Jaster at the piano, her fingers fluttering up and down the keyboard, picking out little tunes as sweet as April showers. Hedgy liked being played for while he had his milk, and Miss Jaster enjoyed having someone to play for. This way, they lived happily for a while. Then, one bright May morning, when the air was soft and full of birdsong, Miss Jaster came into the garden to do her spring planting. She pulled behind her a wagon full of garden tools and flower seeds. She carried a large green watering can with the letters JJ for Jessica Jaster, painted on it in blue. And because the sun was bright, she wore her dark glasses. These glasses made everything look brownish gray, the same color as the empty flower bed and the same color as Hedgy, who was asleep in the middle of it. Miss Jaster combed the bed lightly with the rake. She sprinkled the seeds evenly, marigold and baby's breath in patches of sweet William. She showered it all generously with her watering can, never suspecting that a small spiky animal was in the middle of it. At first, Hedgy thought of moving to a safer spot, but his quills did need combing, and he rather enjoyed having his back scratched, so he stayed. He hardly felt the seeds at all. They were like dust settling among his quills. As for the shower from the watering can, it was like gentle rain, not at all unpleasant. When Miss Jaster went into the house to have lunch, Hedgy went back to sleep, enjoying the most perfect dreams. Every day after that, Miss Jaster came with her watering can to sprinkle the flower bed and watch for green shoots. And every night, Hedgy wandered through the garden, sniffing and nibbling the way hedgehogs do. But after a while, he began feeling restless. Something was happening. He didn't know what, but deep down among his quills, something was stirring and squirming, like a thousand tiny fingers tickling his skin. He was so itchy, he couldn't sleep, and so curious, he had to know just what was wrong. Down by the tool shed, where Miss Jaster filled her watering can, was a small puddle of clear water, for the tap was worn and kept dripping. Hedgy used it as his mirror, and down to this mirror he went to have a look at himself. 
but when he was leaned over the puddle, he stood quite still, curling and uncurling his toes in disbelief. When he saw in the water, what he saw in the water was not his ordinary great brown prickly self, but something quite different. Peeping out from among his quills were little spikes and shoots of green, ready to climb and bloom and fill with bees and honey. Well, he said to himself, now I'm either a flower bed or a vegetable garden. I wonder which. When Miss Jaster came with her watering can that evening, Hedgie was back in his old spot, and the whole flower bed was full of little spikes and shoots of green. So pleased was Miss Jaster to see this, that she played the entire Blue Danube Waltz on her piano twice over before going to bed. But Hedgie was only half listening. Flower bed or vegetable garden? Vegetable garden or flower bed? He kept saying to himself, which am I, I wonder? The fact was that during the day, he'd had the most alarming dreams. First, he dreamt that he was covered with tomato plants. One by one, the tomatoes ripened and dropped off the vine squashing on his head. Then he dreamt that the vines changed. They grew longer and heavier and were covered with large yellow flowers. And the flowers turned into huge ripe melons, dragging behind Hedgie and growing till he could not move another step. At the moment he woke up, all over him and around him were growing plants. If only he could be sure they were not tomatoes or melons. Early the next morning, he went down to the tool shed, nosing about till he found the seed packs. Hedgie pulled the packs out on the floor in front of him. Marigold and baby's breath and fragrant sweet William. He did not know their names, but he did recognize the pictures on the packs. They were neither tomatoes nor melons. Much relieved, he went to have a look at his, himself in the puddle. I believe I shall be quite handsome, he said, and toddled off to bed. Not many days after this, Hedgie woke up early in the afternoon, feeling the presence of a strange new something that hadn't been there the day before. For a while, he lay quite still, wiggling his nose and sniffing, and when he opened his eyes, the flowers were all around him, marigolds and baby's breath and patches of sweet William. I'm in bloom, cried Hedgie and hurried down to the tool shed to look at himself. But no matter how long he looked, or how hard he tried, he could find only one word to describe what he saw. Stupendous! And even that was not really the word he wanted. While he stood there in the sunshine, a small cloud of butterflies and bees gathered around him, fluttering and humming. Hedgie didn't mind. He was not afraid of bees. After all, a bee has only one stinger, he thought. But I have over 200. And who ever heard of anyone being afraid of butterflies? But Hedgie wasn't really thinking of the hum and flutter around him. Something inside him was bursting to get out. The special something that makes birds sing and poets rhyme and puppy dogs chase their tails. Suddenly, his feet began doing little dance steps in the dust, all on their own. 
One moment, they looked as if they were waltzing. The next moment, they were doing a tap dance. Then a skip and a jump, then a slow turn round the puddle. Oh, it cannot be helped, thought Hedgy as he waltzed into the other flower bed. I really shouldn't do this, he said as he jumped over the marigolds. But I absolutely must, he cried as he burst onto the lawn, skipping and jumping and kicking his heels. Around the fish pond he raced, while behind him trailed the bees and butterflies like a noisy cloud of flower petals. Tomorrow, I'll be as quiet as an earthworm, thought Hedgy. But not today. Today is the greatest day of my life. There'll never be another like it. And the bees and the butterflies, tired of chasing their food around the lawn, hoped he was right. Miss Jaster had been dozing in her wicker chair when she saw, or believed she saw, a small patch of her flower bed jump onto the lawn and head for the gate. At first, she thought it was a dream. But when she found that she was quite awake, she said the first thing that came into her head. Stop, thief, she called. And then, at the top of her voice, Stop! Thief! Oh dear, thought Hedgy. The flowers were indeed Miss Jaster's, not his. Taking them out of the flower bed, even if it was the only, only to perform a midsummer dance around the fish pond, did make him kind of a thief. If only Miss Jaster had remained in her chair, Hedgy would have gone back to his place in the flower bed. But she jumped up, waving her parasol, and poor Hedgy, now quite frightened, dashed through the gate and down the road to the village. In a small cloud of dust, many yards behind, came Miss Jaster, her knitting, her parasol, and her cries for help. Then up the road from the village came the police constable on his bicycle, making what speed he could uphill toward Miss Jaster, carrying a parcel to his sister in Winsley. For Hedgy, there was only one thing left to do. He scurried in among the wildflowers on, at the roadside and lay stock still, hoping he would not be seen. Half an hour later, Wimple the constable at last understood, or believed he understood, what had happened. I quite understand, miss, he said, but one last question, please. Did you, by any chance, happen to notice how many legs these flowers had when they made their getaway? In round numbers. A great many, Constable, she said firmly. A great many. Wimple licked his pencil and added his description of the fugitive. Legs, he wrote. Numerous. Very good, miss, he said. We'll have your zinnias back in no time at all. Marigold, said Miss Jaster, and went into her garden. Of course, said Wimple, and moved off down the road. In the 16 years he had been at Sandgate on Sea, no one had ever reported a missing flower bed. Sometimes the children pick a few plums or apples that aren't exactly theirs, he thought. And sometimes, I suppose, they pick a few flowers that, strictly speaking, belong to someone else. But when flower beds started running off on their own, Wimple shook his head sadly. He tried to decide how he should begin. Put yourself in the fugitive's place, the chief constable always told him. Imagine you were running aware, away. Where would you hide?
If I were a flower, thought Wimple, a flower, he could imagine himself being a cabbage or a melon, and for some reason even an artichoke. But a flower? He looked around him. Where would a flower? Of course, he said, slapping his hand against his helmet. That's where I should hide, among the other flowers. He started down the road, poking among the weeds and flowers, looking for marigolds and baby's breath and a patch of sweet William. But it was nearly sunset. Two days later, before he brought Hedgy back to Villa Pax on a leash. Never in his life had Hedgy felt so sad, so tired, and so hopelessly small. His feet were sore, his flowers had wilted. He was a weary, worried, bedraggled little animal, down on his luck. Goodness sakes, said Miss Jaster, it's the hedgehog. Flower hogs more like it, said Wimple. But Miss Jaster had already gone into the house. She came back shortly with a saucer of milk. This time, she took no chance, but knelt right down, down right there on the garden steps, and put the milk in front of Hedgy. She was quite sure this time, for she saw his eyes like two tiny drops of India ink in the fur. And they were looking straight into her own. A little later, freed from the leash and fed and showered, Hedgy toddled back to his flower bed. The constable, having enjoyed a little homemade gooseberry wine in a friendly chat, returned to the village. Miss Jaster lit the lamp on her piano, but tonight her heart was not in the blue Danube waltz. She kept thinking of the friendly little flower hog and the frightful scare she must have given him. After a while, she turned off the lamp and sat looking into the garden till the moon rose behind the junipers. Early the next morning, Hedgy met Miss Jaster on the front steps. She was carrying a tray with her own breakfast and Hedgy's milk. That morning, and many mornings after, they had breakfast together by the fish pond. Miss Jaster in her wicker chair, Hedgy in the grass. After a leisurely breakfast, they went for a walk along the beach, followed by a small but persistent butterfly. At the end of the breakwater, they sat down. Miss Jaster, dangling her feet in the water, Hedgy resting his nose on his paws, and there was nothing but peace and sunshine and a touch of sweet William.